Good afternoon, dear friends here in the US and good evening to those of you who are in Greece and Turkey. My name is Elina Karmokolias and I'm a member of the Prometheus board. And I am Yasmin Paraskeva. My father is Leonidas, a Greek from Istanbul, and I'm the president of the Hellenic Society of Constantinopolitans of Greater Washington. Welcome. Together, we will discuss the book, A Recipe for Daphne, with its author, Nectaria Anastasiadou, who is joining us all the way from Istanbul. Kalispera, Nectaria, and welcome. Kalispera sas apo din boli. It's great. Good morning, I should say. Good morning, Kalimera. <laughs> it's actually Kalispera, it's 12.30 here. So okay. this is the book with its beautiful oriental cover. And here are a few words that the Washington Post Review had to say. In weaving together a delightful present day romantic drama with a more profound narrative about reckoning with and making peace with the past, a recipe for Daphne proves deeply satisfying. And, and satisfying it is, um, as I was reading it, I was transported to the exotic and in many ways mysterious ways of the poly. I could almost listen to the seagulls above the Bosporus and I imagined the ships gliding towards the Sea of Marmara. It's full of vivid descriptions of interesting characters, foods and aromas that fill the city. But I think I'm getting carried away here. So Yasmin, would you like to introduce our guest and say a few things about uh, Nectaria? Absolutely. Nectaria Anastasiadou is the 2019 winner of the Zografio Sagon, a prestigious Greek literary award founded in 19th century Istanbul. She is currently developing the winning short story into a novel written in the Istanbul Greek dialect. One of her short stories was included in the New Rivers Press American Fiction Anthology 2019. She also received honorable mentions in Ruminate's 2015 Short Fiction Contest and Glimmer Train's New Writer Contest, May, June, 2017. Anastasiadou lives in Istanbul. She speaks Greek, Turkish, English, French, Spanish, and Italian. She writes in Greek and in English. Thank you, Yasmin. And before we proceed with our discussion, let me say a few things about the plot to familiarize you with the characters. The story revolves around Daphne, a young American woman who has come to the city of her parents' birth to explore her heritage. She stays with her aunt and uncle on her mother's side and is soon introduced to a colorful group of friends opinionated aunties and neighborhood regulars, almost all from Istanbul's room community who round out the endearing cast of characters. The room once made up about a quarter of Istanbul's population, but have been reduced to fewer than 3000 people today after multiple waves of immigration in the 20th century sparked by animosity and discrimination. Two men from within the group are captivated by Daphne. Fanny's, a feisty 76 year old bon viveur with a long history of womanizing and Cosmas, an award-winning pastry chef who's still living with his mother at 41. At first glance, neither man seems particularly suitable for the young American. Yet both will have a significant impact on her and her decisions about her future. The author who is room and chose to write in English to share the experience with the wider world, sprinkles her characters dialogues with salty Greek and Turkish expressions. She writes with a deep cultural understanding of an insider, incorporating depictions of Orthodox religious rites details about marriage traditions, the sense of duty that is endemic within the family, and wryly commenting on the over-involvement of Greek mothers in their son's lives. As the story unfolds, we become aware of the room community's worry about its survival. 
The elders are particularly haunted by the events of September 1955, when Turks in Istanbul, stirred up by nationalist sentiment in the press about the future of Cyprus, carried out an anti-Greek pogrom as the police, on official orders, turned a blind eye. Thousands of Rome families fled Turkey in the aftermath, and the Rome populace that remained in the city itself were never the same again. Through memories and flashbacks that depart from the novel's main time frame of 2011-2012, Fanny's and other characters attempt to confront this traumatic history. During our discussion, you can post your questions on the chat box. But please keep in mind that our guest has kindly requested that you refrain from personal or political questions. So, uh, Nectaria, your book, as, as I said, is a feast for all senses. The reader is, is immersed in beautiful images and, and delicious scents. What was your inspiration for writing the book? So, I heard an elderly gentleman talking about a pastry, which he said was forgotten. Nobody makes it anymore, or at least nobody makes it like it used to be. Uh, it was called the Balkanik. And he described it as something like uh, a large eclair or something, uh, a large pastry wrapped in something like pan de España, which is, uh, like a, a cake, I guess a vanilla uh, white cake. And it was filled with uh, different kinds of creams and each cream represented one of the Balkan peoples. So one cream for Rums, one for Jews, for Turks, for Armenians, and so on. Uh, and the pastry as a whole represented harmony between these different peoples with their different religions and languages. And because that sort of harmony is something that fascinates me, I knew then that I wanted to write about a pastry chef who would resurrect that recipe. And that pastry chef became my character, Cosmas. I see. Wouldn't that be awesome if the people of the Balkans were able to to mix together and live in harmony as, as uh, the, the, the taste in that uh, pastry. You said it's called the Balkany? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And is, it, and is it popular now? I mean, can, can no, one it's find not, it's not made anymore. I think um, in recent years, somebody has, uh, one or two pastry shops have started making it. I've seen pictures of it on the internet, but it's not like what was described to me. It, it actually doesn't look appetizing at all. Or the the thing that's being made now and being called the balkanik but yes. the the real the the old balkanik is supposedly lost uh well fictionally it's been rediscovered in a recipe for daphne okay what is the significance of the poly the istanbul uh to your novel to daphne your heroine and and to you personally You need to unmute. There we go. Yeah, it, it wasn't letting me before. Uh, yes, so uh, the city is central to the novel. Um, in fact, it's, it's more of a character than a setting. In the novel, Daphne says, in Istanbul, you never know what's around the next corner which is very true. There, there are difficult times, there are wonderful times, but it's never boring. And of course, for a writer, uh, that means a constant inspiration. By writing. Um, in, in Istanbul Greek, we refer to the city as the Poli, as if there were only one Poli, only one city in the entire world. It, it, sometimes it reminds me of the way in Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, Romeo says, there is no world without Verona's walls. So that's what I feel sometimes, that there is no world outside Istanbul. Mm -hmm. 
I really like that analogy, Nectaria. Um, my, as I mentioned before, my father is uh, Leonidas. He was born in Constantinople. Um, he's Greek. But for those of us that don't know, um, can you describe what it means to be Rum uh, and what, what that means to you and how you would explain it to someone who's not familiar at all? Yeah. So in the Byzantine Empire, the Byzantines did not call themselves Byzantines. That's a, a term that was invented much later. They called themselves Romi, which means Romans. And the official religion of the Byzantine Empire was uh, Orthodox Christianity. Mm -hmm. And the, the most widely spoken language was Greek, but of course there were other religions as well <clears throat> and other languages. So when the Ottomans conquered the Byzantine Empire, they continue to refer to the Orthodox Christians within the Ottoman Empire as Rum, which is just um, the, the word used by Turks and Arabs for uh, Romi. And even though, so that group of people, the Rum in the Ottoman Empire were Orthodox Christians, but of, with different languages and different cultures. In modern Turkey, the term is still used for Orthodox Christians, uh, including those who speak Greek in Istanbul, um, and also those who speak Arabic in the province of Hatay. And many uh, people come to Istanbul from Hatay. Their children, uh, even though their families traditionally speak Arabic, their children go to our schools. And many of them learn Greek and speak Greek just as well as anybody who um, whose grandparents, great-grandparents have been here. The reason I do not use the term Greek, um, which is more common, is because, um, well, first of all, that's not what we say here. We say, uh, we are Rum. Um, secondly, I think it gives people who have no idea about our history the impression that uh, the community is, came somewhat recently from Greece. Of course, many people do have heritage from, from Greece, um, but they've been here um, at least for generations, if not for millennia. And then um, maybe a third reason that I use uh, the word room instead of Greek is I feel that we need to be inclusive. Um, the Arabic speaking room from Hatay are uh, an important part of our community. And so I don't want to exclude them by using the word Greek. That was very thorough. Thank you. Um, would you uh, introduce to us uh, maybe some people that haven't read the book yet to the characters, to uh, Daphne, Cosma, and Fanis, um, sure. possibly with a, a small reading? Yes, I would love to. So um, Fanis is sitting in his favorite cafe. Um, he's sitting with his friend Julien, who is a Levantine. That means a um, someone with European heritage, but these, the Levantine families have lived in Istanbul for many generations. Mm -hmm. And his other friend, um, a room widow named Aliki, and their friend, Gabriela, uh, another uh, elderly room woman shows up with a young woman whom they don't know. Uh, I think Cosmas is also sitting with them already and his, his overbearing mother, Rea. So, Gabriela had, ne had never made any mention of an American niece. That was rather strange, suspicious almost. Julien stood and pulled out his chair with a gallant sweep, a bow, and a chivalric turn of the wrist that ended in an upturned palm pointed at the chair. Cosma stood and offered his seat, but without any embellishments. Fanny's tried to do the same, but the skinny gray cat, which had apparently resettled beneath his chair, screeched so loudly that it startled him, and he fell back down. Stay where you are, sir said the niece, we only need two. 
Annoyed that he had been surpassed in gentlemanly conduct, Fanny's waited until Julien and Cosmas had gone inside for more chairs. He took advantage of their absence to pull his seat over to the young ladies and ask, what's your name, dear? Daphne. She gathered her loose hair, which undulated like the curls of a Minoan princess, and let it tumble down her back. The most beautiful name there is, said Fanny's. Where are you from? Miami. He held out his hand. Fanny's. Pleased to meet you, said Daphne. Her voice was nasal and her accent in Greek strange, something between Istanbul and Athens, with a, twin, with a tinge of American. He grasped her fingertips as gently as he would an old tapestry. What beautiful natural nails you have. It takes pluck not to hide behind polish. I suspect you have quite a lot of fire in you. Cut it out or, you're, or you'll scare her away, said Julien, just returned with Cosmas and the extra chairs. Now tell me, Daphne, what brings you to the city? A Turkish class. She twisted a tendril of hair around her finger. Turkish, said Rea. I'm thinking about a PhD in oral history. How interesting, said Fanny. Do you know, my dear Daphne, that you had the heavy eyelids of the last Ottoman sultans? But that's not surprising because most of the sultan's mothers were room. For how long will you be in the city, Daphne? asked Julien. Gabriella removed her dark glasses and announced triumphantly, five weeks. Mm. Everyone hummed in satisfaction. It was long enough. How old are you, dear? asked Aliki. Fanny could have kissed Aliki's bristly cheeks. It was just what he wanted to know, but he made a point of never asking a man's salary or a woman's age. 32, said Daphne. Slightly young for Fanny's, but he was sure he could win her. Instead of taking part in the usual chit chat, he sat back in his chair and listened while each of his friends put forward what they considered the most important subjects. Do you work, sweetie? asked Rea. I'm a teacher. Oh, that's the very best profession for a woman, said Aliki. Rea smiled sweetly at her son, turned back to Daphne and asked, do you love children? Yes, but I don't always love their parents. Are you married? Not yet. Fanny's felt a secret tickle of delight, but he kept his hands folded across his belly as if these details held no importance for him. He watched the flexing and curling of Daphne's unpainted toes and he suspected, despite her confident replies, that her fidgeting was an indication of a certain discomfort. Good for you, said Julien. Marriage destroys romance. Stay single if you want to have a good love life. Still, said Aliki, one gets lonely. Don't worry, little mama, said Gabriella to her niece. We'll find you a groom. But you haven't told us, said Rea. Whose child are you? My aunt's sisters, said Daphne. Everyone laughed. Meanwhile, like any expert hunter, Fanny's was completing the essential task of reconnaissance. The girl prickled at their questions and her replies, although proper, were evasive. How he loved a mysterious woman. Very nice. Uh, in the book, the characters are so well developed. We really feel like we know them and we're sitting at the cafe having coffee with them and pastries. For Fanny's, who was such a colorful character, was there somebody in particular that inspired you uh, to write about this man? So Fanny's is a fictional character. Um, he, he doesn't exist, but I can tell you how he came about. Uh, one evening, I think it was 2010, 2011, uh, I was sitting in the bay window, Jumba we call it in Turkish, of the flats where I was living in uh, Chukurjma, which is a very nostalgic historical neighborhood. Uh, and my street, Fahit Pasha, uh, was a very Urum street. Uh, long ago. I was looking out the window and I took my notebook and I started describing the buildings on the streets, gorgeous old 19th century buildings, from the perspective of an old man who had lived, who had been born on a street and who had lived there for his entire life. So he would have been born in 1935 
when the street was almost entirely room and very manicured, well-kept. Uh, he would have been a young man in 1955 during the pogrom. He would have uh, been become an antique dealer by 1964 uh, when room with Greek passports were deported. He, then he would have seen the degeneration of the area um, when many buildings fell into disrepair, some even derelict. And then the regentrification in uh, the 90s and um, the early part of this century, which was still going on even in 2010, 2011. And that old man became Fanis. Hmm. Okay. He's, he's quite colorful, uh, to say the least. And, and, and I enjoyed uh, reading about him. Uh, and he's 76 years old, and, and despite his age, mm -hmm. uh, he has almost a, a desperate desire to marry and procreate. Mm -hmm. Would you say that this desire is a tender evocation, we should say, uh, of an aging community, um, which is fearful that it may become extinct? Mm -hmm. So the book starts out with Fanny's in the German hospital. He has blacked out, fainted, and he thinks that the doctor is the ancient Greek god Hermes, Hermes. Uh, the doctor diagnoses him with uh, cerebral arteriosclerosis and vascular dementia. However, Fanis rejects this diagnosis. Uh, he doesn't even he doesn't even want to take medication. He is determined to fall in love, get married and have children. So we could laugh at Fanny's and say he has a very exaggerated idea of his own prowess and his fertility. Uh, or we can also look at him as a metaphor for the community because people are always giving us death sentences in almost every article you see about the community it is the last of the Byzantine Greeks or um, you know, the, the, uh, the dwindling, the almost extinct, et cetera. And sometimes we give these death sentences to ourselves as well. Uh, Fanis is rejecting this for himself and for our community. He is determined to keep living and keep going. And I think this is what we need to do as a community as well. We need to uh, reject all of these, these diagnoses about us being the last and almost finished. I, I, I couldn't agree with more, uh, with you uh, more, uh, because despite those death sentences, as you say, your characters have an, an insatiable desire for, for life. Um, they never really age in, in, in their hearts. They flirt and uh, they, they just uh, love life and they're very meticulous about their appearance. They, it's almost as if they come from a bygone era. It, I mean, I was reading about them and I was thinking the generation of my parents where mm -hmm. they, they were very careful about the way they, they looked and especially when they were going out. Uh, is this represent, a representative group or are they somewhat idealized? They are not idealized at all. This is this is very 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 real parts of the novel. Um, our elderly folk here are so vivacious. They are so poetic in the way they speak. Um, so full of life and stories. They amaze me all the time. Um, and also, especially in Pera, where the novel takes place, which we now call Beolu. Um, people are very into dressing nicely um, because Pera has a very long tradition of, of paying attention to dress. Uh, the, our, old, our elders tell us that you, you to go out in Pera, which is now we, we call the, the main street of Pera, Isiklal Jadisi you had to be wearing a suit or a nice dress and a tie, and men had to wear a tie and a hat. And so I think um, we do keep this tradition alive of dressing nicely, but let, I'll tell you a little story about 
how how lively um, we are here. And I and also I think it's partly because we've been through a lot, or at least our elders have been through a lot. They're, they're also very tough. One day, quite a few years ago, uh, it was May Day and the city was in lockdown for May Day. And I was having tea with um, so, some old ladies in uh, the tea hall of St. Constantine and Helen in Talabasha. And it, it was time to go. We got up to go, but somebody told us that they were using tear gas outside. So without missing a beat, the hostess took out a Bunsen burner and she said, okay, it's time for coffee then. So we had another coffee. Uh, we looked at our coffee grinds to see our future. We had more conversation and you know, something that might be a little bit worrying for people in other cities was just another opportunity for coffee. And I, I, things like that happen all the time here. That's that that that's fascinating. I, I really enjoyed this story. And you know, they seem to have the rooms. I, I mean, I see traits of Mediterranean traits. For instance, the overbearing family and the overbearing mother. And I also see very Eastern traits, like um, the women tend to maybe overdress and 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 they wear a lot of jewelry, which you don't see that much in um, the rest of in, in Greece or in uh, other Mediterranean uh, countries. Would you say that the room uh, have achieved a, a balance of East-West or are they more Eastern as characters? I think it's a little bit more complicated than East and West, although I'll come back to that. I think it's really more about, we have a city culture here. We've had it for 2000 years. Uh, in Greece, apart from Thessaloniki, which has, has a long city culture, and it, actually it was a mostly Jewish city culture, Greece has more of a village culture, which is also beautiful, but it is different from a city culture. Athens only became the capital of Greece in 1834, I think, and before that it was a village. Uh, of course, Athens has, has developed a city culture, but obviously one that is not as old as uh, Constantinople, Istanbul's city culture. So a lot of it comes from that, the city culture. And, and our culture is simply unique to this city. So for example, we have our own way of speaking, which is not just the Istanbul idiom. Uh, we, here, this may be a little bit East and West. Greeks tend to speak in terms of definitions, whereas here we, we speak in stories, which is an Eastern thing. So if you ask a Greek, what is friendship? A Greek may say to you, okay, as well, it's when two people, they get together and uh, you know they develop a relationship, something like that, definition. Whereas a uh, rumpolitis uh, will probably say, well, it's like when uh, my neighbor, I say, she came running to help me with this, or they'll give you a story. Uh, so that's one way that maybe we are more, you could say Eastern. Um, but our, our, our manners are often different. Uh, if you, someone tells you to do something in Greece, you're gonna know it because it's very direct and very simple. Uh, if someone tells you to do something in, uh, in Istanbul Greek, um, it's so indirect and so polite that you may wonder if it is just a suggestion. <laughs> um, and that's the same in Turkish. The Turks also do the same. Um, and uh, another thing, we have a different rhythm of life here. Uh, we do not have the siesta like in Greece. We, you can call home all throughout the day. Uh, that's a, a, another city thing. We used to have uh, afternoon tea at five o'clock uh, and many people still keep that tradition or at least they used to before <laughs> we were in lockdown. Um, we, and we pay a lot of attention to dress, like you said, and to our homes. Uh, the homes here are, are, are generally, they're very well kept and decorated. Uh, crystal and 
Silver is very important. Uh, sometimes the Greeks make fun of the um, polites for the crystal and the silver. And uh, the, the curio cabinet, the crisaliera, and the buffet table, which are their furniture in Greece, and people have them. But here it's almost like um, iconostasio number two, like the, the icon, the, um, what do you call the iconostasio? Icon, some, the place where you put the icons. It's like, it's almost like your, your, your curio cabinet is almost like a, a little chapel. Very important. So, so I think a lot of that comes, comes simply from the fact that this is a very long city culture. Uh, we have a very long tradition of, you know, our protocol, the way we do things in church, the way we serve a guest, you know, with the, with the, um, on the tray, we, the coffee has to be served on a tray, not just simply uh, the coffee cup with the saucer. It has to have something to go with it, whether it's a spoon sweet or a chocolate or a marron glacé. We have a certain way of doing things. So I think that is the, the maybe the bigger difference than East and West. Mm -hmm. it, it sounds to me, as, as you, especially when you were describing the, the curio cabinet, because these are pictures that I have of my, my family, my, my aunts and uncles when I was visiting their homes. But these are traditions or the way they serve, uh, you know, the glicati kutelu, the spoon sweets and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and, and, and as Greece is becoming more westernized, if you will, these, um, and, and life is becoming simpler and, and less homogeneous, I would say. Uh, one of the ways that you have been able to maintain your traditions is because you have stayed homogenous. Mm -hmm. Now, Daphne is coming to um, Istanbul from Miami. Uh, she's American, uh, even though her roots are in, in Istanbul, and she falls in love with the city. What are the chances, you think, that uh, she would be able to assimilate and... Um, and adopt the ways of, of, uh, of the city, that, I mean, Istanbul, which is so, so different from Miami. Okay. I would like to do a very, very short, a very short dialogue. Let me read to you from the book that I have it marked because sure. uh, I think it's on point with this subject. So, Daphne and Cosmas are on the islands of, which we call in Greek, Andigoni, uh, Burgazada in Turkish and they are in a horse and carriage and chatting. So Daphne said, my mother says Turkey is the land of surprises and contradictions. Cosmas leaned closer. Perhaps Istanbul will surprise you in a good way. Daphne flinched when the driver swatted one of the horses with his whip. She said, I'm not sure if I will fit in here. Nobody does, said Cosmas. That's partly why we like it. So Istanbul is a city of 15 million people. There are many worlds within this one city. There, there are many, many ways to either fit in or not fit in. And I don't think that always has something to do with whether you were born here or not. I saw a film recently called uh, Istanbul Kırmızısı. Uh, the title is Red Istanbul in English. Um, and it's on Netflix. It's mostly set in an old uh, Bosphorus mansion called the Yalla, because I love old houses. Uh, I had to see it. And there is an elderly Turkish lady who lives in this Yalla, which has probably been in her family for generations. And she says, I don't go out anymore because I feel like a foreigner in my own city. Fanny says something, of course, Fanny goes out, but he, he feels something similar. So I think you can feel like you are a foreigner here, either in place or in time. Uh, and I, I think really, like Cosma says, maybe nobody feels like they fit in, but still we are unavoidably and completely attached to the city. Yeah, I mean, it's very evident that uh, that you are attached. I mean, you personally and also your, your characters. And, and you talked, I, I want to go back a little bit to 
what you said about um, there, there are death sentences about the Roman, you say, but we will survive because we are strong. Mm -hmm. And um, I wonder if you, if you want to expand a little bit uh, on that. I mean, uh, how do you see the, the future of the room in today's globalized world? And, and an added question, if you will, how much of intermarriage is there uh, within the community? I mean, with other faiths or other cultures? Um, so let me say, let me talk about the intermarriage first. Um, yeah. There is quite a bit of intermarriage, um, yes, between uh, with other faiths, with um, other Christians, uh, Armenians, Levantines, um, and also with Jews. And I don't, I think that if we change our ideas about this, that, um, you know, that's, that's totally fine. Uh, and, and it used to be that you were, your identity card would show what your father was. So if you were Muslim, your identity card was going to say Muslim. If you were, you had a own father, your, your identity card would say Christian, it, it, regardless of what your mother was. Uh, and I actually, you couldn't even go to a room school if um, your father wasn't a room, but that's changed now. If your mother is a room, you can. Um, so, so even I think one of the things that when we talk about numbers, we don't know how many numbers are also not including some people who feel room, even though their identity cards may say something else. You know, I, I have a friend whose father was Turkish and her mother's room and she speaks Greek very well and she is an Orthodox Christian, but um, it's possible that her identity card could, she could be registered as something else. I've never asked because I feel it's none of my business, um, but I, I think that it's up to her to decide what she is and not for any bureaucrats or even, um, it's, it's not for anybody else to decide. She participates in the community in a very creative way and uh, so I think now it's not important at all that her father was Turkish. Um, I, in fact, I think that's richness. I think, I think maybe we're starting to see it that way. Hopefully we are, that um, the more um, cultures you have, the richer. And in fact, one of the writers about our community, many writers about our community actually, some of the best, they are Turkish. Um, and some married with Greeks or with Rooms. Uh, let me get back to the, the future of the community. We have lots of old traditions, but we, we have a very long history of maintaining old traditions and embracing modernity at the same time. The, the Christians and Jews of the Ottoman Empire were merchants, diplomats, uh, ship owners, captains, they, we have a long history of, uh, of traveling, of learning other language and cultures and bringing back new, um, new things to Turkey, to Istanbul. We, ha we have a long, a long tradition of wanting to be with the times. Even just, I'll give you a few little examples. Um, I see old ladies who paint their fingernails black or bright orange because that happens to be the fashion. Um, and I think in other countries, you probably wouldn't see old ladies with black fingernails um, or they have their Facebook accounts. Um, our, our, even our elderly folk are always sprinkling that conversation with French and with English and they love to learn, you know, trendy new phrases and use them. Uh, so I, I think we will continue. Uh, we have no problem embracing um, new things and modernity because this is what we have always done. Well, with this desire for life, uh, I can see your community going on and on and I wish you the best of luck. I think Yasmin has a question for you. Um, I'm gonna ask one more question and then uh, we're gonna start answering some of the questions from our uh, viewers today. Um, let's see. <clears throat> Can you talk to us, Nectaria, about the struggle between identity and humanity, which is something that's mentioned in the book? 
Yeah, yeah, we we maybe touched on that a little bit before. So from a humanity perspective, we shouldn't care what uh, anyone's religion or uh, culture is when looking for a partner. But from an identity perspective, especially if you live within a minority, a small minority, uh, if you do not marry within your own community, your traditions and culture could be lost through assimilation. So it's a dilemma. I know a couple who, um, with different religions, they decided that they would not teach either religion to their children so that the children could decide later on, which sounds like a, a very nice open-minded approach. But then when the children grow up, they realized they had deprived their children of both cultures, both religions, and they had nothing to choose from because they felt no affinity with either. Uh, so. Mm -hmm. that, that is indeed a struggle. Uh, Elena, I think you have one last question. Am I correct? Uh, I have one last question, but let me go to a couple of questions from our audience. Uh, they're asking where they can find, I know uh, people can find it on Amazon, but what about in Greek bookstores? Can one find it, the book in Greek bookstores? Um, in Greece or in the United States. In Greece, States. I'm sorry, in, in Greece. As far as I know, no bookstores in Greece are carrying it yet. The uh, best thing you can do is uh, if you would like to get it from a bookstore, which is a nice thing, you will have to convince the bookstore to order it for you and hopefully order a few more copies as well <laughs> for their bookstore. Um, okay. <laughs> and um, do you intend to translate it in Turkish or Greek? I'm, I am already translating it into Greek and I see. Uh, yeah, hopefully um, it will be translated into Turkish as well. I, I won't be doing that. And, and maybe then uh, when, once you translate it in, in Greek, we will find it in Greek bookstores. But I, I'd like yeah, to read. I, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. The reason I'd like to translate it into Greek myself is because I don't want it translated into Athenian Greek. Sometimes you see um, <laughs> films or, with people who are supposedly in uh, Istanbul and Smyrna uh, or wherever, and they're speaking exactly like Athenians. Uh, it's kind of like the Thornbirds. I don't know if you've seen the film, The Thornbirds, where it's supposedly set in Australia, but they all have Midwestern American accents. So I don't want my books to sign. <laughs> I don't want them to be Athenian dolls, supposedly in Istanbul, which is why I'm doing the translation myself so that it is in the proper idea. <laughs> and, and speaking of, of words, this is actually a segue to my next question. Uh, I'd like to read to you from a paragraph that uh, actually stuck with me and made me think. When Fanny's asked Daphne to talk about her necklace, which is an amulet, uh, she describes it as Fatima's hand for Muslims, Solomon's mm -hmm. hand for Jews, and Mother of God's hand for Christians. Mm -hmm. To that, Fanny's replies, my favorite, and, and forgive the pronunciation because I don't speak Turkish, but, uh, my favorite Turkish word is Hoşgürüm which means looking pleasantly upon other people and their ideas. And so much better than tolerance, which really just means that you've decided begrudgingly to put up with others. And it had never occurred to me that tolerance, and as the, it's the Greek translation, anuhi, uh, they also, they, they kind of express a sense of, putting up with something instead of um, accepting it. And, and I thought that this translation is so limited. Uh, I really like Hoshgiru because it illustrates so much better the true meaning of the concept. Yeah, it does. It's a beautiful word. Yeah. And, and if, if we could all have that attitude, how, how much nicer everything would be for all of us. <laughs> Wouldn't it? Yes. Um, there is also one more question. Um, do you intend a sequel? Some One of our uh, participants said that the, the book ends in a way that it calls for a sequel. Um, I don't have a sequel in mind at the moment. I'm, I'm not saying I won't write a sequel. Um, 
right now I'm working on something else. I'm writing uh, a novel. Well, actually, I finished it and I'm just editing now. Uh, a novel in written in Istanbul Greek. Uh, the the narrator is Rum. I'm, some of the other characters are Jewish, and so, so it's another Istanbul Rum novel, but uh, quite different from from Daphne. I don't know. Maybe I will come back to the characters of Daphne later, but I, I need I need a, a little bit of space first. First, yes. Um, speaking of books. Uh, one of our audience members asked if you have uh, another book with the same uh, topic, the room population or uh, room society being the central focus um, in, in any other books. Do you have uh, recommendations either in English or? No, but uh, very, soon. <laughs> very, oh, soon. very soon. Yeah, I'm, I'm almost finished. I'm really at the end. So, and uh, the Greek publishing industry moves a little bit more quickly than the English publishing industry. So, what about other read... authors that you recommend? Oh, other authors writing about our community mm -hmm. um, in fiction. No, I don't know of anything, and not anything con contemporary anyway. Um, I, I, a book pops into my mind in Turkish, and I don't know if there is a Greek translation. Um, I, I can't think of anything very quickly off the top of my head. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me see if we have any other questions. Elena, do you see another question from our viewers? Uh, yes, I see one. Let me read it. It says, um, if you could ask one favor from your room brothers or the diaspora, what would that be? To speak about our community positively and not as dying. To, because I think we have to change our, the way we speak in order to change our ideas and to change our attitudes. Mm -hmm. uh, words have power. So we have to get rid of all of the, I, I will no longer use in interviews words like dwindling, last. I mean, they are in my novel because people say things like this and I thought I need to give voice to, to, to those approaches in order to move past them. Uh, but I no longer use them at all. I make sure that those words are not finding themselves into any of my writing or in any of my interviews. So if you would do that and um, help us, to, for the few of us who, who don't believe uh, that we will continue, help us to believe it. Let's speak positively in order to act positively. That's beautifully said. Beautifully said, and 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 you said that uh, words have uh, power, and 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 definitely your words are very powerful, and and that's why your book is very evocative. And I was also thinking that it would make a beautiful movie. Have you considered it? Um, well, of course, uh, a film is a very different piece of art than a book or a novel. A novel gives you the interior world, which no other art form can give you. So a film is a piece of, a good film anyway, is a piece of uh, metadechni, it's a piece of art after the art. Uh, if it's done very well, um, you know, then it's a, it's a new thing, it's a new piece of art. If um, a very talented filmmaker, such as Dasos Bulmetis, who did Politiki Cuisina, would like to, um, make a new piece of art out of this and also keep the positive message, then I would be very happy to see it made into a film. But I, I think it would make a beautiful movie. And the music in the beginning was from Politiki Cuisina. And, and, and I have to say that I had images of Politiki Cuisina as I was reading uh, your book. Yeah, I love that film. It's probably my favorite or one of my favorites. For me too. For me too. Um, 
would you read to us one of your favorite uh, passages from the book? Sure. So this is a little bit of a shorter passage. Uh, sorry, one second. Okay, so Cosmas is sitting in a cafe by himself uh, on the Bosporus. He has just had a uh, romantic disappointment. He ordered a toasted cheese sandwich and settled down to watch the boats gliding between the Asian and European shores within the strait and across the mouth of the Sea of Marmara. Waves crashed against the quay and sprang up like fountains, leaving pools of salt water on the rough cement. On the other side of the inland sea, the mountains of Anatolia rose into low gray clouds. Cosmas wondered, as he always did while watching Istanbul's waters and the smooth movement of the ferries, why he still lived in the city of his isolation, where he didn't seem to have the slightest chance of ever finding a room wife. Perhaps he should have left long ago for America, Canada, Australia, or Greece, like everybody else. But now he had his patisserie and an aging mother on his head. It was too late. A waiter with a full tray of tea glasses made his way through the tables. Cosmas raised a finger. The man set a glass before him. The seagulls, which seemed to have more of a right to the city than anyone, uttered murderous cries when a hobby fisherman emptied a plastic bucket of fish heads onto the quay. Within minutes, nothing but a water blood trail remained. As Cosmas watched the poor Sunday fishermen casting their lines into the gray Bosphorus, he wished to God that he could be like Fanis, who knew the names of all the female cashiers at the local supermarket, never exited without saying hello to each, and sat in the tea garden like a pasha while women of all ages came to kiss his cheeks and forehead. Cosmas, on the other hand, hadn't even worked up the courage to ask for Daphne's phone number. My God, he said out loud, if only you had made me like Fanis. And then he had it. He would go straight to the source to Fanis and ask the old rascal to become his mentor. He took his phone from his pocket, called Monsieur Julien, and scribbled Fanis Paleologos' phone number on a napkin. Isn't it amazing that uh, we, uh, we always admire the one that's opposite from us and we don't spend enough time to appreciate what we have and what we have to offer because Cosma certainly has a lot to offer. Mm -hmm. But I think this, these beautiful images of the Bosporus give a, a perfectly fine uh, ending to our conversation, which I enjoyed thoroughly and uh, I, I'm sure that our audience has enjoyed it as well. And thank you so much for your time. Uh, I wish you good luck with your book uh, in Greece as well. I know it's doing quite well here in the United States. And it was uh, wonderful to have this conversation with you. Thank you. It was wonderful for me as well to speak with you. Uh, really a lot of fun. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Nectaria, for uh, taking the time from your Sunday to join us and to address your audience all over the world in English. And we look forward to uh, any upcoming projects you would love to share with us. Uh, we would love to have another discussion in the future and we're here for you and happy to spread the word. Thank you so much. I really appreciate all of the work that went into this and uh, you know, such a, a, a lovely hour for everyone. Thank you so much and, and for your appreciation of the book. It's, you know, you spend so much time uh, writing in isolation, it's really wonderful to see that it resonates with other people. Yes. Absolutely. And this recording will be available on YouTube for other people who may want to uh, hear your comments in the future. Um, and we'll definitely be sharing it with our audience as well. Yeah. And, and good evening and uh, good night, maybe, to for those of you in Greece and uh, in, in Istanbul. Uh, to our friends who were with us today, and we look forward to seeing you in our next event. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Good night.